Okay. Boker Tov again. Boker Tov. All right. We're building it some more energy. Activist rabbis. Yes, yes, yes. Activist rabbis. There we go. We are, we are active, and you're active, and we're learning, and I'm very excited uh, for this installment of our class. Um, I don't have a clock in this room, so I want to just... I got, I got, now I got one. Um, we're videotaping, and if anyone missed the first session, it is, uh, it was sent out as like a link, you know, that you can watch it on YouTube. Um, so they are being recorded, which is a lot of fun. I received some questions over the course of last week, um, which I want to start with. But for today, you just need the ashray. Um, and I handed out a new version of it with a little chart on the back. So I've kind of upgraded it slightly. Um, but we're going to start on the ashray side. And I brought pencils this week in case you want to like make your ashray unleash its power individually. You can, you can take the, um, maybe we'll send these down in case anyone else comes. Um, you can use the pencils to, uh, yeah, to help you with your ashray. So I was sent a couple of questions that I wanted to begin with from last week um, or building on last week. And then we're going to go to lesson number two, which is to look at the internal and external structure of the themes and the lines and to try to unpack that. That's going to be our goal today. And then next week, we're going to try to unleash the mystery of the nun, the missing nun. And, um, and then we'll bring it in, in some, you know, some of the additions, the prologue and the afterlogue. So last week, just to review, we saw the hidden structure in the words. Just by counting up the repeating words, we saw the Baruch formula, and we saw the structure of movement. Um, so I'm going to try to build on that in this second session. But if we could, um, the questions I was sent, the first one was about the opening line. And I realized I didn't comment on the opening line, which is in this uh, write-up. And I have some of yours. Um, so if you gave me yours, of course, if you gave me yours and didn't write your name, then, <laughs> then you know, it's, it's less helpful. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> maybe you can tell from, from your notes if it's yours. Um, Okay, so um, let me pass Sam. Will you pass this so I can just write with something? Thank you. All right, so I was sent a question about line three, which is an itty-bitty line. But it is part of the sum, and in this case, very interesting. Someone asked, what does it mean that it's Tihilal David? Now, what do we know about psalms in their introductory lines or words? Most are Mizmor le David. So let's understand the word, and it's always good to just get the word, right? Mizmor in, uh, in print. That's good way to print. Um, design this way. In any case, this way. Um, I'm more comfortable writing in, uh, in script. Mizmor, the root is Zion Memresh. Right? What is a zemer? A song. A song. When do we sing zmirot? When we, yeah, when we sing songs. When we sing songs. In particular, like Shabbat zmirot is like a time for singing songs. So mizmor, the David, the most common opening that we find, would be like a song of David. What's another opening that we have in the book of Psalms? I'll give you a little clue because I'm thinking like the 120s and the 130s. If you're a fan of the number of the Psalms. Shir Hamalot. We're going to give points over here to Judy. Shir Hamalot. Again, songs. Similar word, a synonym for Zemer. Hamalot. Limala is to go up. Right? It's always good to know Israel's airline. Right? El. Al. Is to up. Which is exactly what you're hoping works. Right? <laughs> Great airline name. Um, to up. Right? And this word, al, up. Aliyah to the Torah, right? right? right. Aliyah to Israel. La'alot is to go up. Mm -hmm. Right? Hebrew, just like a few hundred roots, and you'll be ready off to the races. That's all you need. It's that, that easy. So, right? Shir ha'ma'alot, add a mem, right to the beginning, making it a different noun formula. And there you get a song of ascent. And one of the theories behind the Shir Malot is that they were recited as people would climb the stairs right. in the Beit HaMikdash. How many stairs were there? 131. This is a guessing time. 
And we're <laughs> close to 12, a little bit more. Okay, God's name is, one of God's names is Yud. Hey, Yud is 10, Hey is 5, 15. There are 15 steps. There are 15 songs of ascent. There are 15 steps in the cedar. It's oh another one of our like little fun numbers in Judaism. Oh. But we'll leave that aside. Um, ah, we were answering, what does it mean to you, Lada Kavi? A lot of digressions. Um, so Tilala David is very unique because it's the only one of the 150 psalms that has the word psalm, Tehillah. And what do you hear in that word, Tehillah? Close to Tefillah. Oh, it sounds a little like Tefillah, although a different root, right? Tehillah. So find the root. Hey, Lamed, Lamed. Right? The second Lamed becomes a Dagesh, right? So when there's two lamids, sometimes they get doubled, it just becomes a strong lamid, a dagesh. But the root is actually hey lamid lamid. Hallel. Right? The hallel, the songs of praise that we sing. And it's supposed to sound like it. Hebrew is a very onomana poetic language. I might have thrown an extra syllable in, I don't know. But right, it's supposed to sound like it. In many cultures and civilizations, that is the sound of joy and happiness, ululation, right? And all that is connected. Even the word ululation, halalel, right? You, you, can, you can feel that um, in common. Tehillah is a psalm of David. So this is a very unique superscription. Um, that's what we call it, this little introduction, because this is the only one that has Tehillah. As opposed to Shir, Mizmor, and all of that. So that already tells you that either the one who put it on the superscription, the author, uh, him or herself, or in some early phase already saw this psalm as being special. very special. Okay. They didn't put it as like number one or number 150, but apparently more psalms got added. It's 145 um, in any case. So... Uh, what could it mean, Tila le David? Let's talk about the Lamed. Right? What can you, so it could be two. Lamed before a word means two. It's also sometimes short for the word shell. Yeah. Of. of. <laughs> so it could be a psalm of David, or it could be a psalm to David. Right. So what would that mean? So let's try to flesh that out. It could have a couple of different meanings. One could be the common traditional understanding of the Psalms. That David, in fact, a psalm of David. He's sitting there writing. But he didn't. Turns out he didn't. Right? So what could be the other op option? Praise of David. In praise of David, about David, which we have in another psalm that specifically mentions a kind of moment in his life, about a moment in his life. He might have been the patron saint of the arts and literature at that time, and so that he funded musical creations um, literature and that kind of thing. So that might have been another understanding or it could have been simply ascribed to the school of David as Psalms were given this superscription over time. Later authors came along and wrote them. So I was asked to clarify that um, and that's, it's interesting, the book of Psalms is taken from this one Psalm but this is the only one that has that as its introduction. Okay, that was just uh, the question I was sent. I wanted to to get the book of Psalms was taken from this one psalm? The word Tila. It's called the book of Tehillim. The book of Psalms, Tehillim. And this one says Tila, where the others have these other names. Shir, Mizmor, etc. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting. All right. What I wanted to do today, last week we saw the movement from the self to the community to all humanity. And I want to see this now in a different way. So last time we did it by looking at the roots of words and repeating words. And this time we're going to do it through the lines and the structure. So we'll start on the Hebrew side. And through this process today, and you guys are very much my partners in this, so we are unleashing the power of the ashray by actually looking at it together. We will hopefully discover why was this psalm chosen to be so important. You know, there are lots of beautiful texts. There's lots of other ones that are alphabetical acrostics for that matter. Um... Lots of psalms that could have been chosen, but this is the one that's chosen to be three times a day in the liturgy. So something has to be going on that's very significant to place it there. Um, and so I want to see and try to discover, is there a structure? 
and I'm going to offer a structure from, it was uh, first proposed by Ruven Kimmelman, a uh, very great, wonderful teacher and professor. And so not just to see it as an acrostic and the alphabetical acrostic, which is a very easy structure to see, but to look and see if there's some other internal coherence, why this is chosen more than any other song. To do that, let's start with some key lines. And uh, let's, start with, let's start with line four. Okay, the Aromim line, which is actually really line one, if we're going to use like the alphabet, right? There's 21 lines in the alphabet, Aleph through Tav, because there's no Nun, there's actually 22 Hebrew letters. We're going to start with the one line, okay? And we're going to try to come up with what are the themes in a few key lines and see if we can then put a little bit of a kind of a framework into place on this psalm. So let's start with the word Aromimcha. Romamam, Romamam. Le Romeim, right, to exalt, yeah. to lift up, right? I will lift up Elohai HaMelech. Now this is a very other, also interesting formulation because it's the only time in the book of Psalms that we have Elohai, my God, and it's the only time we refer to God as HaMelech. So that immediately tells you this is an, another kind of sui generis part of the text. So it's using language that we don't find elsewhere. Then it has va'avarcha, baruch. We talked a lot about that root baruch, which makes its way throughout the psalm. Shimcha, and I will bless God's name, the olam va'ed. Okay, what about line two? What's similar from line two, or the bet line, to line one? Okay, so everyone see avarecheka, avar, avarcheka is like avarcha, same root. And they're both who's speaking? They're in what person? First person. First, person, first person, right? Every day I will bless you. Mm -hmm. And again, I explained last time how Baruch has many more connotations, but for a simplistic just understanding, I'm just going to use bless, right? Va'avarcha shimcha, va'ahala shimcha le'olam va'ed. And I will halalalalal, and I will praise, glorify, right? Same word as aramimcha, really, total synonyms. They even sound the same, reish mem mem, reish ahay lam and lam Right? But in the same exact ending, Shimcha Le'olam Va'ed. So line one and two, very similar. Only words that get changed is Aromimcha to Ahalala. Ahalala. It's was so much fun just to say it. And then the Avarcha becomes Avarcheka. Okay? Everyone see those, those parts? So line one and two are basically synonyms. Uh, you know, lines that almost say the same thing. So what about the Gadol line? Same theme or new theme? Moving to third person. Does everyone see the shift that Dave noted? Yeah. Right now it's just describing. No longer in the first person. So if I, I and many people put lines one and two or four and five, depending on your number system, Aleph and Bet, as one little unit. Kind of our first unit. And what would be the theme? Praise. Praise, this Baruch theme. Okay. We'll come back to that. But if I was going to put a little theme, so far we'll put Baruch. We'll see if we can define it a little bit more. All right, let's start with line three. We've got Gadol. We still have Mehulal. And then we've got Gadol again. So it might be a new theme of Gadol. Let's see if it gets repeated. Line four, it's Gvuratcha Yagidu. They will praise your deeds, your Masecha, or Gvuratcha. What is Gvura? Strength. Strength. Is strength feel similar to gadol, greatness? Maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Similar, a little different. Hadar kivot hodecha, vridivrei niflotecha asicha. And the words of your niflaot, your wonders. I will have a sicha. What is lesocheach? I will talk about. I will have a conversation about. Again, similar, a little bit different. Everyone see that? Okay, keep going. And your greatness, your gadolness, I will lispor, lisaper is to tell the story. You see the word lisaper, sipur is a story, sefer is a book of stories, right? All the same root, okay? So here you have gadol again. And you had gadol in line three, the gimel line. Um, I don't know if you're using line three or six, whichever counting system you're using. So this proposes that lines three, four, five, and six are a little couplet, a little stanza, starting with gadol and ending with gadol again. 
framed by Gadol, right? And the words in the middle are to reflect about God's greatness, to elaborate about God's greatness. One of the ways of looking at Ashrei is a little bit like Psalm 23. What is one of the most beautiful mm. metaphors in Psalm 23? Kosi Rivaya, my cup overflows. And um, I remember going to my cousin's wedding. I've probably shared this story with a number of you. Uh, he married a woman from, from a Yemenite background in Ashkelon. And apparently you have to invite everyone to the wedding. So almost all of the people of Ashkelon came. No, just not all of them, but a lot. And so they had 600 guests. And so they had a display as you walked in of 600 wine cups overflowing. And the wine would cascade off of the first tier of wine cups to the next layer. And then it would overflow that layer and down and down this huge pyramid of wine glasses. Something like that I've never seen. But it was Kosi Rivaya. My joy is overflowing and abundant. Hmm. And the Ashray is very much written in that kind of mindset that the praise and greatness is just so overflowing. We'll use words and roots from previous lines and keep elaborating on them and keep expanding them. So lines three, four, five, and six. Here the theory is that Gvura, God's power, Niflaot, God's wonder, right, are all kind of synonyms for God's greatness. How is God great? By God's power, Gvura, by God's wonders, Niflaot. And so you have this whole theme of God's greatness in lines three, four, five, and six, Vav, excuse me, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, and Vav. Okay, so that's our stec- second stanza. Now let's see what the theme happened, uh, uh, the new theme is in the Zion line. Zecher Rav Tuvachayabiu. You're the membranes of your great tuvcha. What is the root there? Tov. tov. What is tov? Goodness. Goodness. Right. We will. Um, we will yabiu. Right. We will look at. We will. Um, different ways. We will kind of point out and, and recall it. Um, right. It's in the English. How do they translate it here? Recount. 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 Okay. Vitzikatcha, what is the root of tzikatcha? Tzedek. What does it mean? Righteousness. Righteousness. Okay. Right, we know the word tzedaka. So the theme of this new section could either be tzedek or tov. tov. So let's see. Go to the next line. Chanun verachum Adonai. God is chen. What is chen? Gracious. Gracious, right? Verachum. Right, mercy. mercy and compassion. Everyone know the root of that word? Well, yeah. Rechem, the womb. The place oh. that we all come into the world from, the place that is the most compassionate. So you start with Rechem, Rachamim. Gracious and merciful is Adonai. Erech Hebrew is a very physical language. The words sound like what they're trying to get at, and they also look like what they're trying to get at. Erech is from the word Aroch. Apayim is your Panim. Long-faced. Long-faced, if you're a student of yoga or meditation, is a soft face. As opposed to if you flare your nostrils. You now scrunched up your face. Right? He was a very physical language. They are acting out the emotions in the descriptions. Erech long-face, means you are full of compassion. So again, a synonym. Ugdal chased and filled with chased. What is chased or chased? Kindness. kindness, loving kindness, love. All three, again, a hard word to translate. Then what's the word in the next theme? So again, we, we could have the theme be chesed, or it could be chanun v'rachum, but then it gets a little bit clarified in the next line. What's the theme? God is good to all. It's the 13 attributes of God, erech you wanted to talk about. Yeah, erech Plus the other things as well. Right. Rose is pointing out that this psalmist knew his biblical text, which they clearly did, <laughs> and is going back to the 13 attributes of God from the Torah and pulling out many of those and weaving them also into the text. Erech HaPayim, Virat Chesed, right? Very similar phraseology. The Tet line, the ninth line, tells us our theme. Because we could, it could have been Chesed, it could have been Sedek, it could have been Tov. And what's the winner? Tov. Tov. Because it comes back to that and shows you that this is a little internal structure an internal framework. Lines 7, 8, and 9 are about tov, goodness. 
So if it was in there too. Yeah. So if we look at line one and two as a little couplet, the theme is I'm praising God Baruch. It's kind of different because it's in the first person as opposed to the rest of the psalm. The second stanza is the Gadol stanza, right? Lines three through six, Gimel through Vav. And then the third one is the Tet, Zayin Chetet, the Tov stanza, the goodness part. So hold on to those themes, especially the stanza three through six, seven, eight, nine, Gadol and Tov. And we're going to come back to them and see if they repeat anywhere later in the psalm. The next line is Yud. And like lines one and two, Aleph and Bet, it's going to be a little bit distinct. And let's try to understand why. Yoducha, right? Mm-hmm. Let us know you from the same word, Hoda, right? Oh. Yoducha, koma secha, right? Lahodot means to praise, to acknowledge, to, um, to appreciate. Yoducha, Adonai, koma secha. Right? They will appreciate all of your ma'asim, the things that you have done, here's your creations, the things you have made, la sot, the chasidecha, and your righteous ones, your, your chasidim. It's a hard word to translate also. But we know chasidim, right? The chasidim comes from this word. Your chasidim, your followers, your pious ones, the ones who are filled with loving kindness for you, yivarchucha. Who's, who's speaking? In the, who's We're still in the third person. Okay, but it's now referring to a specific group. They will yivarchucha, like we saw in lines one and two. They will give you baruch, but it's not any longer I as an individual. It's now, right, they, in the community, the chasidim. So we're kind of in a we group. This is the communal group. Remember last time we looked at those three levels in the Baruch formula and saw it as the kind of inner word structure? We're now unleashing the secret of the lines, which has the same structure. Starts with the I praise, an avarcha. Now we're in the we Baruch line, line 10. And line 10, you should set apart. One and two, we'll put as a little unit. Line 10 as a unit. We have three through six, seven, eight, nine. I want to pause for one second and make sure everyone's with me. We're going to see it on the other side, and so I don't want to spoil all the fun, but I'm trying to you know, build up the suspense here. We do have this chart that explains it, but I want you to be able to see it you know, with the words line by line. Okay, so everyone sees how it moves from avarcha in line one and two um, to yivarchucha. They in a community will bless you. All right, let's go to the next line and try to find the theme. 11 is kivod, or if you're using a different counting system, it's 14. <laughs> 11 slash 14. That's good. I like to have two different line systems. Kivod, again, very hard word to translate. I'm just going to use easy words just so we can move. Mm-hmm. Each word, we could spend you know, 20 minutes on each word. Kivod machutcha, the presence or the honor um, or the glory. Let's just go with glory. It's an easy word. The glory of your machutcha, of your kingship they will speak of and of your strength they will speak of two nouns here that we could be have the new theme be one would be so kavod malchut so the glory of your kingship so it's a little bit more of the kingship but it could be that that theme kavod malchutcha or the second half is gvura strength so it's either strength or maybe kingship sovereignty second line Adam Gvurotav to proclaim to all humanity your Gvuratcha. So it seems like the theme is Gvura because we have it again. Uchvod Adar Ah! Didn't really help us. And the glory of your splendid majesty, sovereignty, kingship. Very much synonyms for the previous line. So we see we're in this new stanza, even though we haven't defined the theme because the same two words repeated in both lines. Everyone see that? We had gura in each line and we had machutcha um, in both lines. Let's go to the next line. This might clarify. Machutcha machut kol Your kingship, or the, the kingship of your kingship. This is beautiful, poetic, biblical Hebrew in English. You know, modern English, people would say, can't you use any other synonyms? <laughs> but in Hebrew, to take the same root and use it in two different ways is considered like the height of writing in Hebrew. 
right? Malchutcha, malchut kol olamim. Your sovereignty, your sovereignty is a sovereignty of all worlds, of all time. It transcends time and space. Memshaltecha, what does it mean, memshala in modern Hebrew? Government. The government, right? But it's the same word as malchutcha. It's your, 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 the government, your rule, um, your sovereignty would be a good synonym is in Bechol Dor Vador, is in every generation, which means the same thing, which most of the clauses in the psalm, either they elaborate the, first, the second half of the first, or they're basically just synonyms. So the theme we now see is Machutcha, right? Because it appeared in the beginning of this stanza, and in line 14, the Samech line, slash 17, the Samech line, we're going to have a new theme. We're no longer on Gvura or Machut. So let's put these next three lines, Chaf Lamed Mem, as the Melech, the king. Oh, and it is Melech. <gasps> Donna, you're giving away all my best stuff. Yes, no, no, no. Yes, did everyone see what Donna saw? Look at the first letters. Oh. <laughs> Mem, Lamed, Chaf. We're going to find even one more hidden trick. So we have even more hidden secrets to unleash in the ashray this morning. You'll never look at this text again. I hope the same. You'll look at it and just see like things will be popping out at you every time you look at it. But you see the mem, lamen, and chaf reversed. Those are the three letters of kingship spelled out in the alphabet, And they are the word melech in the theme. But why backwards? Well, that is the way that they appear in the Hebrew alphabet, so they didn't, they didn't have like a lot of options on that. But the fact that the words are, the letters are next to each other, they had a lot of fun with that. Um, let's see if we can play uh, another, another little game. You know what? I'm going to hold off. I'm going to hold off. But come back to Melech. Don't let me forget about Melech. Let's get to one more paragraph. So this stands up. The Chaf, Lam, and Mem is like its initials, and it spells out King. Ruler. Let's go to the next section. What do we see here? This doesn't have a e as simple a theme. It's more based on the theme of the feelings or the ideas in the verses. Somech, lismoch, is a great word. There's so many great parts to it, right? Lismoch is to support. Um, lismoch is smicha, right? Um, is, you know, all these different um, to sustain, right? We have it in the morning blessings. So mech, right, the, you know, that you lift up, or zokef kefufim, who straightens out those who falls. So mech, Adonai lecholon ufim, God supports those who have fallen. And then you have that next phrase, because it's a total synonym. Zokef lechol kefufim, kafuf means you're bent over. At least you straighten up those who are bent over. Those, and that could be a metaphor. Those who are experiencing sadness and brokenness, you sustain them. So that's one. The next one, elecha. Right? The eyes of everyone, Kol, Elecha, are looking to you, right? And you are, uh, right? You are taking care of them. And you give them um, what they need to be sustained, right? What they need to ochel, right? In its time. The next line, very famous line, and there's a lot of drashot on this line. Poteach et yadecha, you open up your hands, umaspia, sova, sustain, give sustenance to, you give enough to, lechol chai ratzon, to all things that are alive, chai, um, like the word chayim, right? Their needs, their ratzon, what they need, what they want. And there's practices with that verse. The Sephardic practice is to open up your hands, to actually think about how I'm going to open my hands today and help those in need. The Ashkenazi practice in the morning service is to touch the tefillin of the arm. How will I do actions in this world? Now it does look a little bit like you're crossing yourself, but it turns out these may be involved in, 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 in actually on purpose of emulating each other. And we don't know if it was a Catholic or Jewish practice first. But uh, I like it very much. I, I, I always do that with my tefillin. Just have always done that. And it, for me, it very much connects me. I do the Ashkenazi. I like the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi practices. You take care of all living things. Sadiq Adonai b'chol derachav. God is righteous in all ways and loving, and loving in all of God's actions. God is close to those who call upon God. Those who will call upon God in truth. God's will is to those who hold God in a sense of awe. And God will listen and save them. God protects those who love him. 
And I'll leave out the negative ending. But, um, <laughs> and, and wipe away the rest. But in any case, what's the theme of all these lines if we were going to try to support it? Taking care of, um, sustaining, righteousness, opening up your hands, right? And you see it in all of these different lines, giving food to those. God's close, karov, shomer, protects, right? These are the benefits that God bestows upon humanity, right? And this unit is very much how, right, is God good, okay? How is God good? So now let's try to... Oh, we have one more verse. I skipped the last verse of the psalm, which is a big, big boo-boo. The last line, Tehillat. And then we're going to try to weave all these stanzas together. How are we doing on time? We're Back doing good. First person. We're, right? Everyone see what happens here? Tehillat Adonai Yidaber Pi. Vivarech Kol Basar Shem Olam Vahed. So all of a sudden, there's a little bit of a different feeling. We have this opening word, which I taught at the beginning. We don't have that often. So that immediately tells you, oh, it's again a tihila. Mm-hmm. It's a psalm, which we don't have in the rest of the psalms as the intro, as the superscription. And here we come back to the superscription. The tihila of God, yidaber pi. And Dave points out that again, it's in the first person. It's my mouth. So suddenly we've gone, kind of come full circle, but then it's quickly expanded very widely. V'yivarech kol basar. We've got our Baruch root again. We're going to bless. But now it's not the Chasidecha. And it's not the I of lines 1 and 2. Or the community of line 10. But it's Kol Basar. Everyone. Who is the Kol Basar? First let's translate it literally. Kol is all. all. Basar is flesh. meat or flesh. Mm-hmm. A very visceral world. All word for all flesh. All humanity. Right? All humanity will bless, and let's look at the ending. Shame could show the olam va'ed. Where do you have this ending? Right? Blessed name, holy name, forever and ever. Where does this appear? The first two lines. Okay, everyone see it there? Vavarcha, shimcha. There it just says shimcha, and doesn't say shame could show. But pretty much the same ending, and certainly the last two words are exactly the same. Forever and ever. So now that circle has moved from the Avarcha I to the Chasidecha God in community to all of humanity. Everyone see it? Mm -hmm. So these three lines, which form the beginning, or if you will, lines 1 and 2, 10 and 21, form a nice internal structure of the movement that we saw last week from Baruch Atah, Praised are you, blessed are you, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai our God in community, Melech HaOlam, King, Sovereign of the Universe, all humanity. Right? You see the movement now in the verses of Psalm themselves. Now we can also see it in the stanzas, but it's a lot easier when you use the chart. So flip over. Yeah, yeah, we'll take some questions and then we'll jump back. I don't know if you want to get into this now, but the, the, uh, the, the statement about the wicked, that seems so out of place. It right? does. It does. I just kind of just tried to just sweep it under the rug, <laughs> was my approach to it. Um, I think... It seems like everybody's going to be in on this praising God and then the wicked that you think they would turn unwicked and start right. praising as opposed to... Us. So, I think it is, it, is, it is not in the way we would have written the song, maybe. I mean, if, you're, if you would have liked it, like it's, it's fine. Wrong, like but... Yeah, I think that for them, like the only way you could now be in a family of all humanity was that those who want to kill us weren't going to be part of that group. Now, we prefer that they repent and perform tshuva and let's all get along. Sometimes that doesn't work out and you go for the uh, the Hashmid formula, which is a little bit more strict. But there are times even in today's world where, you know, we need the Hashmada, the wiping out of evil. So for them, it was a prerequisite to how to enter into community, and it was to show you how God is taking care of you. Just like God takes care of you, God is eliminating the people, just imagine, who are trying to kill you. It would be a way for us to relate to it. I would agree with you 100%. It would have been much nicer to say, and the, and the Rishayim, um, uh, Yachzeru, uh, right? They will return. They will, Yashuvu, would have been easy. 
It even has many of the same letters. So we can imagine the word Yashuvu there. But again, as I've been discussing, you know, in services over the last number of weeks when we get to these kind of passages, it really reflects, a, you know, when you see these kinds of texts, it reflects a different time in the world. And many of our liturgical texts, it refla- reflects a time when Jews were totally disempowered. And so when I read it, I actually try to bring out the feeling of, of empathy for what they must have experienced as being so disempowered that the only thing that they had to help strengthen them was we hope our enemies go away. Um, I, think, I think it was, they were venting. They were realizing. Yeah, I, th- I think that's absolutely right. They didn't have a many, most mm-hmm. of Jewish history, if you think about our people, up until 75, how old is Israel? 70 years ago, right? We didn't have any ability, right? The times that we tried to defend ourselves went horribly wrong. Even like the time it was like a moderate success in the Hanukkah story, within a couple of decades, the Hasmoneans were like the most corrupt and awful rulers. And Meshuggah, I mean, they even make some governments today look good, dare I say. I mean, like King Herod was a certifiable, like he makes crazy people today actually look not as crazy. I mean, you know, a guy who wiped out his family. I mean, they were really nuts. So that, like, you can't think of a time in Jewish history where we had power, And we were like in a good space. Um, And so for much of Jewish history, we were writing from a very disempowered place. So I think they read that that line is just simply like, oh, and we'll be okay and we'll be safe. Um, Today, I think for us, you know, it's more challenging. So I read it for either to elicit empathy in our ancestors' experience, which was profoundly more dangerous, difficult, and challenging. I'm reading this new book called Chosen Wars about the beginning of American Judaism. And just to... Um, you know, so I'm at the very beginning and Jews come in here in the 1600s and in just their, their experience and suddenly like you, you have any rights, you're, they're thrown out of countries, they've been kicked out of country. I mean, it's just so removed from our experience, even as we lived 75 years after the Shoah, in a way it's like their experience was closer to the Shoah than, than us, even though we're in time closer to it. They experienced such disempowering. You know, someone could simply say, you don't have any rights. You can't, you can't live here. Right? There were no Jews in Massachusetts where there were in New Amsterdam and in South, in South Carolina because there they were allowed to practice a little bit. Although, you know, one of the texty sites in the beginning of the book is, be quiet about it. Like, don't, don't get too carried away. Don't show off that you're Jewish, you know, in any way. We'll let you, we'll let you sit here quietly. So it's almost like, you know, you're, you're praising God and you're God's wonder and God's protection. But, you know, keep your, uh, you know, like... Kind of like keep an eye. Yeah, right. Yeah. So maybe maybe the good way to look at it, Laura, is that in some of the Psalms they do this. Some of them have many more verses about the evil. And this one has a half of an end verse, you know, so it's like as a percentage, it's only like two percent of the text. So that's pretty good and low. Um, but you do find this in other Psalms. We can look even later in the 140s, um, where the Psalm is very powerful. Think of Psalm, the next Psalm, 146 has that at the end, right? God's taking care of the stranger and, and the orphan and son, and there's a little bit of the, yeah. and we'll wipe out all the evil. Yeah. You know, we have to kind of throw that in there. That, I think for them, was how they, they experienced that. A good question. So in all of this, we're struggling where we have no power. I'm not seeing, oh, but God's going to handle it for us. Right? In, in these verses. That, in these. It's not that kind of... Um, relationship. I mean, we're praising, but what are we expecting? Yeah, so I what think... What are we th- expecting God to do in our downtroddenness? So that's a great question. All these lines, the somech, right? God's lifting up those who fall. Is it like active, which it is, because the verbal form is in the present, or, right? And then there's a switch, right? Everyone see the switch? No, right? No. The race line. Okay, one line up from the end, right? There's Reish and Shin, okay? The li- in that whole section from the Somech line, right? They're all descriptions. God lifts up the fallen. God um, opens, you open your hands and you sustain all living things. It's all in the present tense. And then it's Ritzon Yurei of Yaaseh. God will do the will of those who fear God, who hold God in a sense of awe. It switches to the future. Did you see that switch? Right? And all those who call upon God in truth. The last line, Shomer and I call of Av, God, that one's in the present. But the Rishayim, the evil, Yashmid, God will take care of that. Mm-hmm. Right? You haven't done it because there's lots of wicked people, you know. 
look out your windows. There's plenty of bad stuff. But we hope we're going to get to a place that will have that a little bit better. All right, let's, um, let's take a look at the structure. I wanted to show you how these paragraphs weave together. And then hopefully do a couple more things if we have time. And luckily we have one more class. It's not next week. Next week, uh, it's in two weeks. I'm actually doing something fun next week. I was just invited to speak at Hancock Church. Think about how the relationship between Jews and Christians has totally changed in 75 years. I was like thinking if I could have spoken to my grandparents about it. I was just invited to speak in church next Sunday. And, and, and they could have come and watched it. All right, and we're having a kosher meal there in two weeks, which has never happened. Yes, if you're looking for a great program that will hopefully encourage you about good things in the world, um, join us uh, for that weekend in two weeks with Shorashim here at Amuna or at... Um, or at Hancock Church. Let's take a look at the paragraph. So in this chart, right, it's all fleshed out. So line one, the Aramimcha line, mm -hmm. okay, and line two, Bechol Yom Avarcheka, I will praise you, almost the same thing, right, that's individual blessing. I'm doing the outer structure, if you will, the overall structure of the psalm. Line 10, we saw is the communal blessing, right, Chasidecha, right, in this community. And finally, number 21, Right, all humanity, all creatures, the humanity blessing. So there's your external structure. Now take a look at the internal structure. We had the first part, which was gadol, right? Mm -hmm. Lines three, four, five, and six, forming one stanza. That's the greatness paragraph, okay? Then we had it, a paragraph about gedula, seven, eight, and nine. And again, starting and ending with that same word, right, of gidula. That's, uh, excuse me, what did I say? The first one is tov, and now this one is tov lakol, right? It is good to all. So seven, eight, and nine are tov. So if stanza one is greatness, stanza two is goodness, okay? Stanza three, right, we started with malchutcha, malchut kol alamim, and we ended with... Uh, Right? Malchutcha Malchut, and it started with um, uh, Kivod Malchutcha, right? So 11, 12, and 13 were all about kingship, Melech. And then we saw 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 were God's acts of kindness. How God is good to us. Or here, here it's listed as benevolence. So one of the theories here is that this is a movement back and forth with different ways of experiencing God. And this was a great way of, of describing God. God is beyond description. This great mystery, something of spirituality that is best felt and not described in words. So how do we get at it? And one of the common ways in our Jewish tradition is to move back and forth between the transcendent and the imminent. Something that is more distant and something that is much closer. One of our famous prayers that does this that you may have never even noticed is Adon Olam. Right? It starts, Adon Olam Asher Malach. Right? You are the Adon, the master of the world. Right? Very transcendent understanding of God that it opens with. But then there's a shift in the second half of the Adon Olam, and it becomes a very intimate poem. And very much not for the end of services, which is not when it was written for, you know, kind of joyful and invite all the kids up, though I wouldn't change that for anything. But it is actually a prayer written for going to sleep. Biyado oh. Afkid Ruchi. Into your hands I will place as a picadon, as a deposit, my ruach, my very life force. Be'et yeah. ishan, soon I will fall asleep. Ve'a'ira, and then I hope I will wake up. Ve'im ruchi geviati, and if my ruach, my life force, does not return, it gives out. I breathe my last breath. Adonai li ve'lo'ira, I will be with God. I will be in that presence, and I will not be afraid. That is, the, that is what we sing at the end of Shabbat. You know, and the kinderlach are all there, and it's a very sweet moment. But it is a moment uh, before death, and it is a moment before going to sleep, which the rabbis teach us is one sixtieth of death. And it's the last two words I say to my children every single night. Right? I sing the Shema in the first paragraph, and then those last two lines from Biado. As my mother did with me, as my grandmother did with my mother, it was passed down from the generations. But that is a very intimate moment, a feeling and experience of God's presence and imminence. And that same technique of the move from transcendence to imminence is what we see here in the ashray. 
We have Gedula. How is God great? The way a king comes down to you. And imagine maybe a more friendly king than we might have in your mind, but someone who comes and is taking care of you. The king will protect you, right? In the best form of that. How is God good to you? Oh, God lifts up the fallen. You see it in stanza two to four, right? This move from, right, how is God close to you and good to you? Oh, here are the ways. God feeds everyone. God lifts up those who have fallen. God is taking care of us in a very kind of tachless way. Um, and so this move from the gidula to the machut, from the tov to the acts of tov, the acts of goodness, um, reinforce it. And by the way, this move also sound, is, is, is in the words themselves. You can sort of hear them. Somech, um, shomer, right? The sounds reinforce these ideas um, throughout the psalm. So now the question is, after we have all these different themes existing, can we pull out a dominant theme of this whole psalm? And that's what I want to try to conclude with today. We'll leave a couple of minutes for some Q&A, and that way lead into next week's um, or two weeks from now's class, which will actually hopefully open up this um, missing nun and weave it back into the theme. So the core first question is, is there a theme? What could be the theme? The blessings all together. So we've got blessings, blessings. right? Beginning, middle, and end. Yeah, right. That's a good one, Baruch. And we saw that last week because of its root that kept repeating the Baruch root, and we know that gets adopted, so that would be a good choice anyway because we're all saying Brachot, and we're, we're living thousands of years after the psalm, so we know that brachot made it. They made the cut, and there are many brachot. Now, another way to look at it might be with the unusual word. And Reuven Kimmelman postulates that because there is a kind of unusual formulation, that's what he sees as something that's very distinct, that separates the psalm from other texts and gives it its unique theme. He hypothesizes that it is that opening line where it says, Elohai HaMelech, my God, which is of course very intimate, right, because it's this relationship, and this idea of Melucha, of the king. And the author wants to exalt this king, right, who he wants, and I'm presuming it's a he, but whom he or she wants to feel close to, and maybe even does feel close to, but of course this king is very distant. This king is not, is not in time, space, that you can relate to simply. So the author starts with what is the evidence of God's kingship, of God's machut? Um, and normally that's answered in a very specific way in Judaism. If you're looking at the biblical text, or even think of a prayer like Kiddush, we want the evidence of God's kingship, we turn to what that God did. Think Kiddush. Took us out of Egypt. The number one answer on the board. Ding, ding, ding. Family feud, if you remember those days. Right? But that would be it. God took us out of Egypt. Zecher litziat mitzrayim. Over and over again. It's after the Shema. It's in the Psalms. It's in, right, it's in the, all kinds of prayers. It's in Kiddush. Right? It weaves its way through everyone. Redemption. And that takes us out of Egypt. So one choice might have been how God acts in history. By the way, it could be creation also. Right? Um, you know, Zecher Lamase Vereshit, we also say in the Kiddush, as Kiddush has both elements, which makes it such a neat prayer because it has the creation, creation paradigm and it has the revelation paradigm. So you might start with God acting in history. Um, but of course, it didn't do that in this psalm. This isn't like you took us out of Egypt, you know, remember we were at Sinai, all those good things. It doesn't do that. It discusses God's greatness and God's goodness. Um, but shows it in its own kind of way through the lenses of these words, right? Of the gadol, the tov, mm -hmm. the melech, and then the kinds of chesed that God performs in this world. Um, now there's one other cool little trick that I wanted to show you, building on Donna's cool, cool trick that she found. Mm -hmm. Go back to those lines. Mm -hmm. The chaf, lamed, and mem. And one of these lines... Line, I'm trying to remember which it is. I think it's line 11. I hope it is. Take a look at line 11. And there's a letter, there are three letters that repeat six times. I forgot which line it is, but it's one of these lines. 
Kavod Malchut. So how many Mems do we have? Got Lots of Mems. 11 or 13? I'm trying to do 11, 12, 13. Kavod, Laodia, and Malchutcha. One of the lines, when I was doing this yesterday, it all the math worked out. I'd be very disappointed if it doesn't. Six mems in Malchutcha. Okay, maybe I wrote the wrong line down. Okay. How many lamets? Six lamets. How many mems? Line 13. Line 13, I'm trying. Hopefully it works, but we're about to find out. Six. No. Five. One, two, three, four, five. Five members. Five There's six to become the final cut. Right? Machutcha. Machutcha. Do you have to count them? Six. There's six. Yeah. I can't count. So I'm counting line 13, the mem line. Mems, you have one, two, three, four, five. Six. 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 There's a final one. Mem. There's a final mem. Right. Where's the final mem? Olamim. Olamim. Excellent. That's the one, of course, I skipped. Everyone see it? Yeah. Right? Malchut has one. Malchut has two. Olamim has two. That's four. Mem has two. That makes six. All right, the Lamed, line, Lamed letter in that line? One, two, three, four, five, six. Lameds are easy to find because they stick up. Chaf now is a little trickier because it can morph into the final Chaf. Machut has two. Machut has one. Kol is four. I skipped that one. Memshal Techa, five. And Bechol, six. Yeah. And it makes 18, which is high. There you go. Long live the king. Melechai. So if you play with this letter, the argument is six times mem, six times lamed, six times chaf, coming at the end of the melech section, which then if you go back over the same three lines, spells out melech, and the word itself repeats throughout the psalm, and especially this stanza. So we probably think that the word melech is the theme. Right, the, the theme is I want to glorify my God. I start with the I, I move to the we, and hopefully now all of humanity, we've gotten all the, those who are wanting to do us harm have repented. They weren't wiped out. They were nicely redeemed and saved. And now we are all in this together, expressing our wonder to the king and thanking the king for all of this majesty and blessing. How does it relate to 150, which is all people, all uh, you, uh, everybody? Right. So Sam raises a great question. This psalm directly relates to what Sam just raised, Psalm 150. As a matter of fact, the rabbis see this as a unit, Psalm 145 to Psalm 150. And that's why they said to us, you really should sing the whole book of Psalms every day. <sighs> Okay, you really should. Like, you know, it's like your doctor. Like, you really should get eight hours of sleep, and you should exercise for 30 minutes, and meditate for 20 minutes, and eat three meals slowly, and only whole grains, and the list goes on and on. And then you're like, doctor. One thing that I've done, please, is one thing. Okay, uh, and drink lots of water, and you should be in community because community is healthy for you. And try to gather regularly. Yeah. Joel, check, 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 check. You're good. So the doctor gives you this long list and prescription of all these things. And then you kind of say, you know what, I can't really do all of that. So the doctor comes back and goes, well, why don't you take two of these tablets and, and, you know, and one of the other from column B. You know, that's going, to be, that's going to be what you can start with. So the rabbi said, why don't you say Psalms 145 through 150? Because you don't have time for the whole book. So why don't we just do that? And that was their idea, um, which became Sukkot Zimra, the morning uh, psalms of praise. And that we start with the Ashray and we get to 150. And what Sam just mentioned really explains the whole kind of bookends of that experience. Because how does Psalm 150 and the book of Psalms ends? Kol hanshama tehalelia hallelujah. 
Let all things that right. breathe, call on Shema, everything, let praise all you. the breath of life praise you. And so it is in fact that same move that echoes line 21 here, the, te- the tough line, is echoed at the end of Psalm 150. And so now you are fully at one. And that's the move of davening itself, right? Davening in the morning, which is really where it be- all began, right, uh, you know, starts with the self because we all start with ourselves, right? When you wake up, and I see this very clearly, the first thing that happens, we wake up, who's taking the dog out to pee? <laughs> and like, it has to be done immediately. And the dog's needs... But usually you're focused on your needs and you need to go to the bathroom and you need to get a glass of water and you need to get dressed or you're running late or, or whatever it is or you're stressed about the day. We very much start in our own bodies and our own experiences. And the point of tefillah, and, and I would argue this and in the book that I was going to write, it was all going to be about the move from yourself to beyond yourself. And if prayer is working, you feel a sense of connection to other people, our community, humanity, the minyan, God, spirituality, what have you. And you have experienced that same move of the bracha formula, that same move of the ashray, or if you will, the same journey from Psalm 145 to this final, like, beautiful sense of hallelujah. And when we sing it, you know, then you feel it. And that's why that was one of the first things that I wanted to do when I got here. We used to only say the ashray, which of course is lovely, has many secrets. Um, but I felt like we needed a little bit more and to give that frame of 145 to 150. Whether you say all the Psalms, whether you just take one line, whether it just gives you three more minutes to breathe, whatever it is, it's to extend a little bit of that feeling and bring it more into the experience. Mm. So um, all these other things you were just mentioning do not talk about <coughs> God as king. And in fact, I don't think of him as a king. It's only on the high holidays, really. That, that you have that metaphor. Yeah, so it's funny that... That that's such a... Well, it depends which kind of king you're thinking of. What kind of king are you thinking of? Like with a crown. <laughs> <laughs> right, with a crown. Is the king judging you, or is it more just kind of like around for happy occasions? Just like a leadership role, I guess. So I think that the, the psalmist here, right, is the king will take care of things. Oh. And the king, right, the people ask for a king in different times in Jewish history. Very socialist. Right, because they saw the king would take care of their knees and would help them. Now, more often than not, the kings actually got into a lot of wars and the kings needed a lot of horses and stuff and taxes to pay for their palaces and they became a little crazy with power. But, but here it's very much a benevolent king, one who's going to take care of you. Marilyn, wait one second, Marty. Marilyn, with us. We're recognizing the individual, recognizing his kingship, praising him right. with his greatness and then saying, Help us. Help us. To be what we have to be. Nice. Marty. Almost, I think almost every, if not 100%, every bracha has the formula, Eloheinu, Melech, Ha'olam. No matter what. I mean... Mm-hmm. No matter what. Yeah. Right. It is very, you know, there's a patriarchal element there. If you're not into, mm-hmm. you know, right. so that's problematic for some of us yeah. who don't like that way. I think, I think it is a, it was clearly the common, and, the, co- the common and dominant metaphor and motif, one that clearly resonated for our ancestors. Today, I very much struggle with it, and I try to soften it to a much less gendered and less authoritarian kind of idea of a benevolent ruler yeah. um, and that kind of feeling. But the feeling is the key word that it ends with, is the olam. So if there's something to take away with, it's the feeling that you are now at one with this force that undergirds and sustains the entire olam, the entire universe. And, uh, you know, I always say that if you're going to redo the burning bush for, like, kids today, we would redo it, and instead of a bush, it would be like, you know, your phone only had power for one day, but it lasted eight days, and and then and, and my... Uh, yeah, I'm mixing a lot of different things, but, but you know, and then, and then, you know, and the phone didn't go out. Somehow the battery power at 1%, and, and somehow it kept burning, and the phone starts talking to you, and then you say back to the phone, what is your name? And they say, Siri... No, I mean, they say... <laughs> and they come back and they say right yeah i can't say popeye (laughs) and they say um and and the phone would would say i am space time right i am the fabric that undergirds the universe and we would have to update that burning bush uh, story 
for kind of today's contemporary uh, metaphors and understandings to make it relevant. Um, but the feeling is that you are one with the universe. And that sense of that you have moved beyond yourself, whether it's the bracha formula, whether it's the ashray, whether it's seeing it in the words, whether it's seeing it now you see this internal line structure, whether it's seeing it in this word melech. Um, yes, I think for a lot of us that we're very uncomfortable with that word. It feels male and, and, and gendered and problematic. But what I try to go to is the place of feeling when I see Melech now, that I'm not thinking gendered, I'm not thinking a king with a crown, I'm thinking of the sense of, um, a sense of being cared for and supported and held. Um, you know, if anyone ever has taken like a supportive yoga class where you're in these chairs and they just like, they prop you up on all these pillows and you're just held. Think about maybe your own parents and someone who held you in your life. Think about a moment where you just felt taken care of. Mm -hmm. And that's when I see that word Melech, I feel like, oh, okay, there's, you know, there is uh, a force, an idea that's in the universe that is helping us uh, and helping me and taking care of me. And I think that's really where the psalmist wanted us to go. So we'll end for this week, uh, and we'll be back in two weeks at the old time. Uh, and I apologize, there won't be a breakfast, so all the Torah sustenance will have to come from the actual text. Uh, and we'll meet at around 9.45. I don't know what room. I'm all confused. But in a room, presumably. And have a wonderful two weeks. Tadarabha.